Hi, this is Guy Wallace with another video in my series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, with your host, me, Guy Wallace. Note, I've also subtitled this series, The Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, but for yours. I'm just kidding. In this video, we're going to cover uh, or overview my models and methods of impact, a subset of this series, performance-based training and development paths, and individual planning guides. I've been producing these performance-based training and development paths since 1981. My former business partner, the late Ray Svensson, presented on this before I left Motorola and joined his organization. That organization was MTech, Motorola's Training and Education Center. And Ray was brought in to talk with us um, by Bill Wiggenhorn on strategic planning for training and development, which is what Ray was doing with Bill Wiggenhorn and the new organization MTech. Um, Ray also spoke about the training and development governance and advisory systems, something that I participated in as I skip level reported to Bill Wiggenhorn for the first nine months of my 18 months at MTech. But he also talked about a thing called curriculum architecture, which really struck me at the time. And although I don't recall any of the details uh, about what Ray presented uh, specifically and what really hooked me, um, I, I thought that the whole notion of a curriculum architecture was a great concept, a great idea. Uh, back in those days, I mean this was 1981, um, what people used to develop a training plan was the course catalog. And of course, the course catalog had things organized by functional areas such as marketing and engineering and perhaps manufacturing and sales. Um, but it then would just list these courses. So they were all, you know, a series of one off sets of instruction, if you will. Um, and people would have to go through that to try to determine, you know, what made sense. Were there any prerequisite relationships? Uh, back in those days, there were a lot of courses that were strung together as prerequisites to the next in a series, etc. Um, but you weren't, weren't often sure as to, you know, what, what you should take and when you sh might take it. Uh, and it was all kind of a loosey-goosey process, if you will. But so what Ray talked about, the curriculum architecture, an idea that had come from the Bell System Center for Technical Education, where Ray had been working before he ventured out on his own. Ray was a former Bell Labs engineer, a bench engineer on radio frequency stuff, uh, then went into Bell Labs management, and then went into AT&T management, where his focus was on strategic planning across the entire AT&T system, if you will, the telephony system of the United States. Um, and uh, he then was sent to do strategic planning for this Bell System Center for Technical Education in Lyle, Illinois, that was attending to the training needs of 50,000 engineers across the entire Bell system. Um, you know, new products were coming out from Bell Labs and Western Electric, the manufacturing arm of AT&T, and uh, those would then be deployed out to the to, out to the states, basically, you know, Illinois Bell, Indiana Bell, New Jersey Bell, etc. Um, and the engineers, uh, both in AT&T and in the Bell operating companies, would need to be, be instructed, would have, need training on the new technologies that were coming out. It wasn't just incremental improvements always, I mean sometimes, but sometimes there was radical step increases in the technology and the learning, the training, the knowledge required to you know, install and operate and maintain and troubleshoot those things uh, were what, it, you know, engineers were on the payroll to do. But I took these notions of curriculum architecture um, and starting in 1981 at Motorola, I built a methodology to establish, uh, establish them. Um, I was working on a project that my clients, 30 manufacturing operations managers or moms, they were calling it the ABCs of supervision. So manufacturing supervisors, um, I had 30 of those moms that were my client group. So there were at least 30 facilities where there were supervisors in the manufacturing world. And they crossed over five business sectors, otherwise known as the strategic business units. And so there were you know, common core things for each of these supervisors that they would need to learn as they came from probably a factory line 
uh, manufacturing job into the world of supervision. And so there were some things that were, you know, universally needed across all five business sectors, but then there were unique things that were required depending on the business sector that you were in and then based on the location that you were in. So there was a lot of, you know, variability in terms of what this... So I, I took that notion of curriculum architecture and I applied it to my big project uh, going after what was first initially called the ABCs of supervision. Um, I created a performance-based training and development path with five stream lanes, if you will, uh, work stream lanes uh, in the swim lane kind of a tr map tradition here, which, you know, I first got uh, exposed to that by Gary Rumler weeks and weeks before meeting Ray Svensson and hearing about this. So I kind of combined Gary's swim lane, lane map methodology or tool diagram, if you will, and and built a path. And so I could show what things crossed all five of these paths, if you will, and which things were unique to the SBU and then to the location. And so I mapped out this curriculum architecture. I had looked at what content already existed in the Motorola inventory, and most of this was really out in the uh, uh, business uh, units and and at the sites themselves because MTech was a brand new corporate training function it had been uh, taken down 10 years earlier everything was deployed you know decentralized out to the field when they decided okay that's not really working and the challenges that we face uh, require a more centralized approach they reinstituted a corporate training function MTech later became Motorola University under the watch of Bill Wigginhorn um, but uh, so, I, so I developed this and it was very successful. My clients kind of loved it. A lot of it was uh, content that was intended to be self-paced. Now, curriculum architecture design and training development path identifies both the existing content that's ready for you know, participation in right now and also what are the gap modules of a modular curriculum. Um, and so it identified those things and, you know, gave visual cues and clues as to, you know, this exists, but these next ones do not. And then it became a challenge for my 30 operations, uh, manufacturing operations managers to prioritize the gaps. And of course, they all fought for things that were, you know, from, for their site or their uh, uh, strategic business unit, business sector. And, uh, you know, so that became a, a, their challenge, you know, to give me direction as to what to go pursue, what to, as a training project supervisor, my job was to basically conduct the analysis and sometimes the design, and then to hire in the people who would develop the content. Um, and if our budgets had ever gotten slashed, you know, we'd go back to being developers as well. That was the operating uh, theory of the organization that uh, was designed and put in place. Uh, so I've been evolving these methods really since 1981 and probably near the end of the 80s, I had kind of finalized everything. I had all my formats and terminology all cleaned up. I had uh, migrated uh, that similar approach to my version of Addy beyond curriculum architecture design. So once you had uh, developed a training development path with both the existing content and content that needed to be modified and gap content, uh, then you'd have to go build or buy that content. So I have a methodology that follows on that using similar approaches, uh, facilitated group process, uh, an engineering architectural approach to content at that level, content development. Uh, to date, I've done 76 of these projects as a consultant, plus the one at Motorola, and I've produced over 100 training and development paths, as sometimes a project will produce more than one path. And we'll take a look at an example where there were eight paths produced for out of one project for another telecommunications client that I had as a consultant. Uh, training and development paths address both onboarding development and ongoing development. So beyond just, you know, welcome aboard and here's what you need, um, I have a, uh, my methodology extends beyond that. So once we get somebody, you know, on board, so to speak, the, you know, their learning needs continue. And you can't cram all of that into the first day or week or month because they're not gonna retain much of that. And so you need to space it out, whether it's the initial learning or 
uh, reinforcement, refresher, reminder kinds of uh, strategies you use to keep something that was learned uh, top of mind, so to speak, and so it doesn't you know, slide down the forgetting curve, which I like to say is steeper than the learning curve. Um, so, uh, and, the, and these training and development paths kind of reflect, you know, my flipped version of the 70-20-10, you know, reference model as it's sometimes referred to. Meaning, uh, for me, you know, most 10 before most 20 before most 70. So if 10 is your formal instruction and 20 is are things that you would get from, you know, social interactions, whether that's a structured on the job training or unstructured on the job training where you just go and ask somebody for some help or, you know, you're in the 70 where it's you know, trial and error and you learn it by hook or by crook by, you know, uh, perhaps making errors. Well, that's, you know, problematic in a manufacturing uh, environment because people can get hurt, people can die, products can be produced and shipped that are no good and that ruins your reputation as a manufacturer. So there's many reasons to really prepare people for their jobs up front and then let the learning continue on the job socially, informally, etc. Um, so the, the, another key thing about the, the, the name of these training and development paths have been called many, many things since I first started doing this in 1981. I mean, they're called the training path, the learning blueprint, development roadmap, training and development path, performance development map, performance competency development map, learning blueprints, uh, development menu, um, a training guide, a competency guide. I mean, my clients have sometimes not liked the language that I use. And of course, I try to be very accommodating uh, to meet their needs. You know, I believe in speaking the language of the business and if the business calls something that's similar to a training and development path or an individual uh, uh, development plan, if they have other language for that, other labels for that, then I'll embrace that because, you know, I need it to work within their environment and not impose my language, my labels on them. Now, most clients, in truth, did not have any language or labels like that, so they took mine and embraced it and maybe they changed it after I had left, I don't know, but, uh, you know, that's how that goes. So I've got a couple of example training and development paths to look at, and these are really high level. It'd be like looking at the architectural rendering for a building or a home that you're going to build. You know, you don't have it, but you know, this is what it's going to look like, so you can well imagine it. Um, the, uh, and I don't have many examples of these things, and I've been given permission by some clients to use these things in my own marketing, so that's why I'm able to share some of these with you today. But uh, back in, eight, in 86, I did a curriculum uh, architecture design project for AT&T network systems focused on their product management functions across they had also five business units uh, strategic business units that uh, these people were uh, deployed across and uh, then in and I'd been asking my client to, because they were the marketing organization and they built all the fancy posters and sales support stuff they had the capabilities uh, the people and the capabilities to produce uh, a visual poster. And so I've been, normally when I do this and when I delivered my first uh, effort in 86 to them, we did it on blueprint paper. And that's what the path was on. But that wasn't very pretty and, you know, they even commented about that. But, you know, this was an architectural rendering, if you will, of their content. And so that's why we used the blueprint paper. After a while, we got away from that when the technology was made it more affordable for us to produce our own paths. But uh, so AT&T Network Systems produced a path after I did the update to the 86 curriculum because they felt their training or their the training would require significant updates and changes because they believed that their world had changed so drastically. But when we did the review of all the analysis data and then the design and refreshed it, there was very little that had actually changed. I mean, there were some things, there were new processes and new organizations to incorporate into the overall curriculum. Um, but in 89, they, they, they bought into my idea of creating a visual marketing poster for the curriculum. And I'd been hounding them, quite frankly, because I thought, well, they have the capabilities to do this. They could probably do a really good job of this. So let's, you know, do something. So I'd mapped it out on a flip chart page. And so after they, we did the 89 refresh, they produced one of these things. And the intent was to go find where do all the product managers live and work? 
um, and where do they congregate? You know, so my thing was, you know, where, where's the coffee pots? You know, find a blank wall near the coffee and uh, put this thing up on the wall and they can stand there and stare at it and read the names of the modular content and they can decide, you know, if this is right for them or whatever. But anyway, that's what this first example is. Then we did a refresh in 91 and I don't believe that the client updated uh, the modularization, the configuration of content didn't change, but some of the content within each of these modules would need to change. And so the path itself didn't change and the numbering system and the naming conventions that I used, um, they were all still good in that, in that third attempt, the second refresh. In uh, 2000, uh, my organization did a project for Verizon for their call centers and this was for inbound sales. So that's when you, the consumer, would call them up and say, okay, I, I'm interested in this uh, call forwarding uh, thing that you've got and uh, um, features like that. And uh, so there were seven different regions that were made up of the old GTE uh, organization that had been merged with uh, uh, Atlantic Bell and uh, I think a couple other Bell operating companies, but that escapes me right now. But uh, anyway, so they, they had seven sets of curricula to cover these seven major call centers and the maintenance was killing the organization and as the people back at corporate headquarters took a look at these things they're saying you know out in these seven regions they're all updating this one set of content and it's really the same thing so not only did we spend our money uh, for first costs seven times more than necessary or something close to that um, because there would be some unique differences, but then we're maintaining it each piece each set of content seven times and those costs are killing us So I think it's an important lesson that you look beyond first cost to the life cycle costs for Content it's product management concept if you will now they had the seven regions and seven call centers, but in the call center that attended to the the New York area the New York State area, there was a subset within that group that had to deal with different regulatory requirements in the city of New York, being a huge financial capital of the world. Um, there were harsher and more strict requirements for people you know, doing call center work. And so there, while there were seven regions, we produced eight paths because we want to get something that's, you know, as close as possible, as feasible to the unique requirements of people with the same job title. Because if you're out on the West Coast versus the East Coast, the public utility commissions that over were the regulators, if you will, and overseeing what these organizations were doing, they had different rules. How you opened a call, how you closed a call, how you summarized, you know, what the customer was ordering before you pushed the button and placed their order. Um, you know, and, you know, did they have an opportunity to back out of the whole deal and how long did that take? All that stuff varied almost state by state. Um, so, you know, there were minimally 50 sets of regulations that these organizations had to contend with. So, you know, as a inbound call salesperson, you know, I'd put in your number, it would come up on my screen, and I'd know what was the opening statements that I had to make and what were the closing statements that I had to make because of where the call came from. And one of the things, of course, I had to do was confirm that you're calling from your home and that number is, you know, going to guide me in, in terms of what regulations do I need to follow. So was, a lot of that was built into the green screen computers that these people were using and all that stuff. But, you know, there's more to it than just reading what's on the green screen. Um, and then, you know, there's the whole, you're, you're in sales. So there's, you know, understanding the customer's needs and selling them on products that have features that would have benefits that would have advantages to them. And, you know, so you're, and you're always trying to upsell. And, you know, if you hear kids uh, in the background, you would say, do, you, do your teenagers need a, another telephone line? <laughs> you know, so, so those are the kinds of things that we had to um, in, include in that curriculum. But there were eight versions of those. 
Then in 2003, I did a project for the Norfolk Naval Shipyard, one of the big shipyards of the Navy, and this was for the civilian groups that you know run the shipyard. It's not just a bunch of you know sailors you know operating everything. There's a bunch of civilians, and uh, so this was for the production organization and for the first two levels of management in the production organization, the production supervisors and the production zone managers. And so we did this project and we produced these two paths and two uh, individual development planning guides so that people could look at the path and decide, okay, what to down select, what do they need, and then to resequence it all because we had a suggested sequence in the path. I mean, it's a path, so it does, you know, provide a, a visual sequence, if you will, a, 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 a continuum, if you will, of learning that builds on one another, you know, the prerequisite kind of a concept. Uh, and we, although we try to minimize that prerequisite stuff. Um, but uh, so the theory was that if you entered the organization as a zone manager, you're actually going to go have to go back to the supervisor and pick up the training that, you know, under normal circumstances, supervisors become zone managers. And so you're building on the knowledge and skills developed formally and informally when you were a supervisor. But if you didn't have that, you didn't understand, you know, how do I deal with people's pay? And if I'm a zone manager and my supervisor is gone, then somebody's got a pay issue. I've got to attend to that right away. And so I can't say, you know, wait till your supervisor comes back from, you know, their two week vacation and then we'll take care of your pay. You know, that that doesn't work very well. Um, so those were those two paths. And then there is another one here from 2004 for Eli Lilly. Uh, this was for uh, global clinical trials where they're testing drugs as part of the requirements of the FDA, the F uh, Food and Drug Administration in America, but in all the other countries that Eli Lilly operated in and conducted clinical trials to meet the requirements of their regulators in the countries that they operated in, um, you know, so they needed to have training for that and they wanted it to be as common as possible but deal with the unique differences because, of course, there were, because the regulators don't all agree in terms of, you know, how, sh you know, what do you have to do and how do you have to do it. Um, this project was interesting because they had done a Six Sigma project to create a process, but the, my organiz my client at Eli Lilly, who had been my clients at Amico pr prior to that, um, they, they looked at the data that came out of the Six Sigma project and they said, this is not sufficient for us to actually build and construct a curriculum architecture design and then go source content from things that we already have and then build or buy the content that's missing. And so they brought me in to kind of run a pilot test. If they were going to run Six Sigma projects like this and generate these kinds of things, you know, can we use Guy's methodology, which they were very familiar with, um, and apply that to here and we'll have the process map information which is somewhat equivalent to Guy's performance model um, and we'll use that but so Guy used the process maps that came out of the Six Sigma effort um, and then systematically derived the enabling knowledge and skills which is data that doesn't come out of a Six Sigma project and then we use that to look at okay so out of the existing inventory of content across Eli Lilly what do you have and can we use it reuse it as is or after modification or no it's not applicable it sounds like it should fit and be good but if you look closer at it it doesn't really fit and so we're going to have to you know not use that um, and be declarative about it because there may be people who own that content inside the corporation and they want us to use it and they think well you know it sounds right at the title level and you know maybe one level below that but if you get into the details of what they're teaching it doesn't fit and we you know have to explain that and show our analysis data to point out to you know course owners if you will you know why or why not their stuff you know fit or didn't fit so each of these training and development uh, uh, paths are based on some rigorous performance analysis, which is then used to systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills. And I've talked about that elsewhere in this video series, so I won't go any deeper on that. But, uh, you know, in my opinion, paths need to be as rigorous as required and as flexible as feasible. And I have two examples here. So this is one of the Verizon inbound sales uh, paths. And 
the what the client's uh, intention was and what the context and situation was is that they were going to be hiring a whole bunch of people at one time and putting them through a series of training things before they release them out to the floor so to speak to do the sales call selling and uh, so everybody was going to go through everything lockstep as one cohort and uh, you know this is uh, um, necessary at times you know it's not necessarily the ideal way of doing it but it was the way they approached it and this is what you know this is what I had to help them meet their requirements as they articulated them so we built these eight paths and they were all as rigorous as required and so there wasn't much flexibility in this uh, there you may not be able to see this but there's some little red dots on this and those indicate where we're going to flunk people out we're going to test them their performance capabilities are they learning what they need to learn and those that don't make it because the clients knew they'd had a history of doing this and not everybody is you know cut out to be a inbound sales call salesperson but uh so the the that that was a path that was extremely rigorous now my next example is the one from the Norfolk Naval Shipyard and this is the supervisor path and this is as flexible as feasible um, while there are each of these boxes which are training and development events composed of uh, a modular thing called lessons and instructional activities if you build it out but there's, so there's three levels of design behind all of these boxes, um, but it would tell you, you know, does this already exist? Do we have this? Or do we have this and we're going to have to modify it and get it up to date? Or is this a total gap? Um, are these, you know, uh, electives or are they highly recommended or are some of these mandatory? And of course, you know, if it's mandatory, it's mandatory. And if the client were to build a test out uh, thing on the front end, then you could test out of taking something, but you were going to have to take certain things because it was just core. And, uh, you know, if it was used as a CYA uh, by the legal organization to fend off the regulators because, you know, after all, we did train Guy and we've got the records for that. And so if Guy screws up and breaks the law, violates the regulations when he's doing this job here, you know, it's not on us, it's on Guy. Um, and so clients, you know, sometimes need to have that kind of protection because, you know, sometimes guy is striving for the, you know, sales award or some nonsense and he's willing to bend the rules a bit in order to make his sales goals. Um, and of course that's unfortunate, but, you know, sometimes that's what happens as people are being managed thusly. So another thing that's, uh, so, so there's, you know, so there, but paths should be as rigorous as required and as flexible as feasible. Um, that does a service to all the various stakeholders, including the learners, the participants in training, their management, upper management, um, the regulators, the shareholders, the downstream customers, um, the customer's customer, the suppliers. I mean, you, you're trying to capture everything here so that you can uh, meet the needs and help all of these stakeholders achieve their requirements. Another thing about uh, about this whole notion here is there's been this thing about personalization that's been going on in the L&D world for quite a, quite a while now. Um, but I believe in performanceizing these paths first, performanceizing training, learning, instruction first, and then worrying about personalizing it. So the intention of the individual development plan, an IDP, it's been called that since I entered the business in 79. Um, and of course, there's various names for it, so it's not a universal label. Um, was that uh, we would use the individual training development uh, uh, plan to help facilitate this down select from the path. Because just because you have a job title similar to other people doesn't mean that your job assignment is exactly the same. Nor does it mean that your incoming knowledge and skills, which you're bringing to the performance party, so to speak, is the same. There's all that variation. The job assignment is a variation. My incoming knowledge and skills that I bring into the job, that's a variation. And so having the inflexible 
training and development path that Verizon had, you know, that's that's what you're contending with. There's a lot of wasted effort and things like that, but sometimes it's deemed as, you know, the more appropriate business thing to do. Um, but we don't need to put people through training that doesn't relate to their specific job assignment. And so how can we give them an out? You know, just because it's on the path doesn't mean that you need to take it. It's something for you to consider. And so the planning process that created an individual development plan down selected from the path and resequenced it and timed it. You know, what do I need this first week, month on the job, the first quarter, the next quarter? What's going on in the business? What are my job assignments relative to what's going on in the business? And so there are things that might have been thought to be needed way down at the end of the path on the right hand side, but we moved it up to the first week because we have a thing coming up, you know, in a week or a month and we need to get guy prepared for that. And so that's what the nature of that is. So that's where we personalize the training. And of course, within the training, instruction, learning itself, you can personalize it further depending on, you know, the mode and media that you're using. If I'm watching a video, you know, like you, you can't personalize what I'm telling you now and, you know, skip to the most relevant pieces for you and avoid the things that you already know. That's not the nature of this particular mode and medium. So. Uh, so we, I've been writing about this and presenting about uh, training and development paths and the individual development planning guides for a long time. And in 1984, I was a co-author with uh, two of my business partners and one of our other staff members in writing this article, How to Build a Training Structure That Won't Keep Burning Down. Now it was for Training Magazine, September of 1984. That was not the title we submitted to training. But that's the, what the editors did, you know, and then they put in graphics. And, but one of the things I really liked is that they highlighted that this was done via a group process, which was our differentiator as a ISD shop, if you will. And uh, we didn't, you know, we avoided analysis paralysis by building teams and facilitating teams through both design or excuse me, analysis and then design. So, and, you know, we did our design thinking and our agile approaches way back then. And if you take a look at this article, you'll see a lot of overlap between some of these uh, new concepts, or as I like to refer to them, the Wyona, you know, what's old is new again, um, as we revive things and rename them and repackage them. Um, a lot of the things that we are doing now that some people consider to be new aren't. Um, they're kind of old school, in fact. And the year after that uh, Training Magazine article came out, I did my uh, first national presentation on curriculum architecture design and talked about paths and all that stuff. And we, you know, we said that the, the curriculum architecture identifies the component modules of training. It provides for flexible sequenced paths through the curriculum. Because if you have a curriculum, a set of curricula, and you've got four jobs, you know, they're going to be four different paths. I mean, you could do it in one path and make people, you know, skip more things that are on the path. But my goal was always to try to get this as close to possible, as close as possible to the real needs of people with that job title. And from there, I'll let the planning process personalize it and avoid things that aren't necessary and time things differently than the path might suggest. Um, and, you know, the, it also identified the estimated lengths, delivery methods, the development priorities, because when you're done with one of these things, you better know here are the gaps and here's what the priorities are and what things are we going to leave to what Guy calls unstructured OJT, which 20 years later became known as informal learning. Uh, and it's all required to support the performance requirements of an individual job or a function, so multiple jobs. So that was our intent from the very beginning. This is not going after one job title after another. You could tackle an entire, you know, every job title that works in a series of processes or the entire departmental function of sales, which would include, you know, people back at uh, management and sales and the back office and sales and the frontline uh, salespeople and the sales management and you know that whole hierarchy um, I've tackled those you know and those are larger more complex project uh, projects uh, and but there's a lot of overlap between you know what does the district sales manager need and the first line sales manager need there's a lot of similarities in that 
and of course we expect you know by the time you get to be a district sales manager you already know the stuff that from the prior jobs that you had and so we're just you know layering on you know what's new and different for you in this promotion that you got every path has a beginning a middle and an end and this is a device that I created or borrowed uh, for my design process because as we're taking the analysis data and saying you know where does this one piece go does this go at the beginning of the path in the middle of the path at the end of the path where um, as we begin to sort the analysis data before we configure it into this modular curriculum approach so and and uh, you know when it when push came to shove and we're trying to decide you know where in the beginning does this go well the beginning has a beginning and a middle and an end and the middle has a beginning and a middle and an end and an end has a beginning and a middle and so my you know carving things into three pieces actually was nine segments if you will of a curriculum and I would tell the design team as we're working with them you know later on we'll figure out is this really three big segments of training or four or ten we'll figure that out when we're done and we have it all laid out on the on the design table if you will um, but so what's important about the beginning and middle and end of the beginning of the path that's the onboarding so I've reserved the beginning of the path to be onboarding and when we're done with the content and the beginning we're done with onboarding and then we're into ongoing which could be you know the next part of the path two parts three parts ten parts whatever and uh, so I've arbitrarily said you know so the beginning has a beginning and a middle and then so the beginning of the beginning is intended to demystify the organization that you've joined so you're a cog in the great big machinery of your enterprise so what is that enterprise and how is it organized and so you know welcome to the corporation welcome to the strategic business unit welcome to your division welcome to your facility welcome to your functional uh, area welcome to your department welcome to your job and we give you a little high level overview of your job because in the mid middle of the beginning we're gonna go deep on what your job is so we're going to orient you to what are all the areas of performance of your job. Now, areas of performance is a term, a phrase that I use. It's also known as major duties, accomplishments, key results areas, and a bunch of other names that sometimes have nuanced meanings to particular groups. And so I've avoided that because I don't need to trip into their nuanced interpretation and go, God, that's not right. Well, you know, so, the, so I use this uh, um, areas of performance, AOPs and uh, so I would orient you to the entire job demystify the entire job these are your outputs you know and here's these segments of your job these areas of performance here are the outputs that you're going to be responsible for here are the tasks that you're going to be involved in and here's some roles and responsibilities of your job title and other job titles that may be participating in a task performance to produce these worthy outputs in this portion of your job this segment this area of performance so we're demystifying all of it. It's a huge set of advanced organizers, if you will. And, uh, you know, we know that we're going to have to refresh people on this because they're not going to be able to retain necessarily all those details. But we need to demystify the organization in the beginning of the beginning. In the middle of the beginning, we need to demystify the, the uh, job and get really down to brass tacks. And sometimes that involves figuring out and just because you have the same job title doesn't mean you have the same job assignment. So that's, you know, that's a mechanism here that needs to be taken care of back at the organization where these people come from because people in some central training function can't tell them, you know, hey, your job's different than all the other people with that same job title and here's what it is. No, we need to provide, I provide structured on-the-job training for people to go back to their management and figure out, okay, am I responsible for all of this or some of it or what? And then they can figure that out and then usually I include that as part of the developing all the rest of the plan. Then there comes the end of the beginning of a training and development path. And this is what I would call the immediate survival skills. So theoretically, because this is more of a theory than a reality, I get the organization demystified so I understand my place in it and I understand all the functions and what we do for a living in this department, that department, this business unit, that business unit, this division, etc. And then I understand what my job entails and I've got that down so I have a clear understanding of that. And then I go to work. Ah, but before I go to work, I'm going to need these immediate survival skills, things I'm going to need, uh, theoretically, on day one. Now, most people don't get that before they actually land in the job. Sometimes they do. Uh, most of the time, they do not. 
And so what is it that we need to arm the performers with, knowledge and skill and competence wise, before they take the wheel, so to speak, back out on the job? What immediate survival skills? And even if the training is deployed to them out on the job, these are the things that they need to take right away. So that front end loads the path, if you will, with the onboarding content, and that's my construct for onboarding. Demystify the organization, demystify the job, and then provide all the immediate survival skills, and then the entire rest of the training and development path are the ongoing development needs, because just because I'm done with onboarding doesn't mean I'm done with my development. Uh, unfortunately, that's too true in too many places, uh, and this is intended to, you know, provide an alternate uh, approach to all of that. Um, I have a seven-step design process where I take the design team, who were all members of the analysis team, and these are all master performers, other subject matter experts, uh, supervisors sometimes and sometimes novice performers because, and this is a challenge I give to my project steering teams, if the master performers that you've handpicked all have 15 to 20 years of experience, who's going to represent the new guy, the new gal, the new people coming on board here and what that experience is for them? So what I would suggest to the project steering team is they pick a couple of people who have shown themselves to be sharp, bright performers, who have mastered things quickly, and ask them to join the analysis team and then the design team to represent new people. Because people with 15 and 20 years experience have no clue as to what it's like for a new person, generally. I mean, sometimes they do, sometimes they're responsible for bringing them up into the system, and so they have a, a fair idea of that. But So that's a business decision for the project steering team uh, to make as to whether or not to include novice performers, not you know people brand new without any experience, but people who are relatively new to this and seem to have caught on to what the job is and have a better understanding of what it's like to be a new person. And so that we can get that voice, the voice of the customers, involved. So the voice of the novice performers gets mixed in with the voice of the master performers, the voice of other subject matter experts, SMEs. And that those are the voices that we use. So, you know, do we have empathy for the, uh, the learners, the participants in training? You bet. Who, who brings that empathy to the party? Those people. Not a bunch of instructional design types who are going to pretend that they have empathy for those people because if they do have empathy, it is so shallow that you couldn't drown a worm in it. I just made that up. Anyway, so there's some alternative approaches to doing curriculum architecture designs. Some things that have really annoyed me as I've read them over the years because I have a rather rigorous performance-based approach to this. And I watched somebody's video one time and it was, all right, so here's how you go about in creating a, a curriculum architecture. And really, they're talking about creating a training and development uh, path. And they would say, well, you take all the training that you have uh, already in place for that target audience, and you put it out on the table, and you play this game of moving things around till you get it into a sequence that seems to make sense. And voila, you're done. And I thought, well, what about all the gap stuff? And what about all that content that's now on your path that is really topic oriented and not task oriented? You know, maybe you need to know that t topic in order to master the task to be able to perform once you get back on the job, but a whole bunch of topic oriented content is not going to get you very far performance wise. Um, it's not going to improve uh, the business situation. The only metrics something like that approach is going to do is increase your costs with little return. And so negative ROI or nil. Maybe you do get a little. Um, and so I, you know, that's one of the things that, uh, so I had a client, the, the client at Norfolk Naval Shipyard, one of the two people that I work with there, uh, big dog. He, he, he and I were talking about all this and then he emailed me uh, after after we had been talking about these alternative approaches, because he'd been in the training business for quite a while and he knew quite a bit of things here, and never seen anything like like what I was bringing to their organization. But uh, so he kind of referred to this other approach as the curriculum review 
and polish approach. And of course there's an acronym that goes along with that and I'll let you figure that out. Curriculum, review, and polish. Anyway, so that's that's what he said that he had seen in during most of his career when people were going in to do something equivalent to this training and development path is that they would simply take what they had, uh, polish it up a little bit and then present it as if it's new and meaningful and uh, at best what it does is it gives somebody a suggested sequence of the training to go through but will it affect performance? Sometimes yes and sometimes no. On my website, in uh, my blog and in other parts of my website here, I have hundreds and hundreds of resources on performance-based training and development, curriculum architecture design, and my follow-on ADDIE level development process, MCD. Um, and so you can look for that. You can find the training magazine article from 1984 in that. Uh, there's my Lean ISD book that I wrote in 1999 after starting it in 1983. And uh, Lean ISD gives a, you know, a fair amount of detail for all of this. The book is available as a free 410 page PDF. It's also available as a Kindle and it's also available as a paperback. So you know, you, if you want to print out 410 pages and put it in the binder or spend 15 bucks on the uh, paperback version of the book, you know, that's your choice. Uh, my goal was to get it out there and, you know, I'm not going to get rich and retire on, uh, on my book revenues. Then in 2011, I updated uh, both, uh, well, Lean ISD and four other books and reconfigured them into six books. So, as I told Bob Mager, you know, I've got my own six pack. Bob. <laughs> and he said good luck with that. Um, but anyway, so one of the books uh, focuses specifically on curriculum architecture design and so a lot of the details and background, more than I've gone into here, may be found there. So that's it uh, in this video in my series Adventures in Training, uh, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development with your host, me, Guy Wallace. Uh, also this series is known as the Insomnia Solution but not for my insomnia, but for yours. I'm just kidding. Cheers.